So I'm very pleased to introduce our next instructor, who's at the JPL, uh, Jim Cutts. Uh, Jim did his undergraduate work in physics at Cambridge University and received his PhD in planetary science from Caltech. Uh, he's been at Caltech and JPL for many years since then. He's worked in uh, uh, planetary science, sensor technology, various innovative mission concepts. As a, uh, Jim is program manager for Outer Play, uh, Planet Flagship Mission Studies at JPL, and he's here to tell us about aerial platforms. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be talking today about the role of aerial platforms in this uh, Venus in situ sample capture and analysis uh, mission. And uh, I think the role of these platforms are quite diverse. Uh, so I've divided my talk into uh, five segments here. Uh, the first one is to talk about the, the first and so far the only aerial platform to have flown at Venus. And by the way, the first micro spacecraft to visit any planet. This was the Vega balloon mission of 1985. I'm then gonna go on to talk about uh, alternative ways of acquiring a sample from the Venus surface and bringing it back to Earth. The, the architecture of the overall concept of Venus surface sample return. Now, of course, we're gonna talk about not bringing it back to Earth at this point, but bringing it into the upper atmosphere. But that part of it, uh, getting it to the upper atmosphere was very much part of these uh, early concepts that were looked at. Um, I'll then look into detail about the technology of actually lifting samples from the surface to the cloud layer. There's quite a lot of work done on this in the decade between 1995 and 2005 by JPL and various uh, collaborators. Uh, going on from there, I'm going to talk about the aerial laboratory itself. Um, we're talking about a laboratory in the atmosphere where analysis would be made of samples brought to it. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how we might implement such an area laboratory, uh, building on some of the ideas we've developed for uh, aerobots of the kind that Norm was describing, that are primarily focused on investigating the atmosphere itself, the cloud layer, and indeed doing geophysical observations of the surface. And then finally, I'm going to be talking about the the question of sample site selection and sample transfer. Noam talked about the varying reasons why you would uh, want to go to the surface and acquire a sample. Uh, Venus is a very diverse planet. Uh, we can't just go anywhere uh, and hope to find something interesting any more than that would be the case on the Earth. And so I believe there's a major role for mobile aerial platforms in identifying sampling sites and then ultimately for transferring samples from the ascent balloon to the aerial lab. So let me begin with the, uh, with the Vega mission. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this. This was uh, uh, a mission that was, the, was part of the very last Soviet mission uh, in 1985 called the Vega mission. Vega didn't have cameras on it, it landed on the dark side of Venus, so that wasn't very uh, appropriate. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Noam uh, showed you a number of pictures of, the, uh, of, uh, of what these landers took. The landers were about a meter in size, but they were placed inside of an entry vehicle, which was quite unlike our own. Uh, it was a sphere, and there was plenty of room in the, in the two-meter sphere for other stuff. And so on uh, this last occasion, they packed in a a small balloon and a gondola and the inflation tanks that were needed to get it to operate. And it was quite a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, the balloon shown on the right, and you can ac actually see, uh, uh, see this in the Air and Space Museum in, in Washington, the, the one near the Dulles Airport. And uh, it's about 3.5 meter diameter. The gondola is, is only six kilograms. I mean, I mean, this is truly remarkable. There were there were five individual sensors on this, a, a battery of one kilogram that, that allowed it to communicate to Earth. It was tracked for 48 hours by uh, tracking stations over the entire Earth. And this was actually organized by JPL, the, the tracking, uh, tracking of the balloon. Uh, 
And the uh, and the graphic on the left shows the profile that it it uh, it um, arrived at Venus in the nighttime. It floated at an altitude of about 53 kilometers. It oscillated a little bit about that, and then after about 34 hours, it entered the day side, and uh, and then it operated until about 48 hours. And, and each of the balloons, there were there were two of these, operated for almost exactly the same period. And, um, and the termination of the mission was not due to the failure of the balloon. It was due to the fact that there was no more power uh, to operate. So uh, this was a so-called super pressure balloon, not a very uh, high technology one by any means. Uh, uh, one of the people involved in, in this came to work for JPL after the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, told us quite a bit about it. It was a very much of a rush job to get this to happen. Uh, but it really demonstrated that this could be done. And, uh, and JPL, uh, since that time, has looked at various concepts for following up on this. So what about this uh, question then of Venus surface sample return? Uh, back in the 70s, uh, the first concept for using a balloon to lift a sample to an altitude high enough where it could potentially be launched to orbit uh, was described by Alan Friedlander and Harvey Feingold, two former colleagues of mine, by the way, although I wasn't aware of this work at the time I knew them. And then in the 80s, uh, Kerry Nock and Ross Jones of JPL, working with Professor Jacques Blamont of CNES, and Jacques Blamont was really the, the, the person behind the the Soviet Venus balloon. It was going to be a French balloon, but the French ran out of money, and so the, the Soviets built it instead. But uh, Jacques was from then on uh, uh, almost infatuated with the possibilities of balloons, and he worked with JPL on the idea of carrying a sample up to orbit, and then uh, where, where it would then actually be retrieved by, uh, they said, small robotic airplanes and transferred to an as ascent rocket. I've talked to Kerry Nock about the paper um, in the last week. He, he doesn't have a copy of the details in the paper. This is uh, something I found on the JPL website, but there's not much more detail. But in the late 1990s, uh, NASA began to plan a Mars sample return mission, which was that time planned for the years 2003, 2005. They were going to have two of them. Uh, and this stimulated interest in further studies of a Venus surface sample return mission. So what I'm going to be talking about here is what uh, uh, what that um, uh, what came of those studies, uh, what ideas emerged. And then in, in the early 2000s, the Planetary Science Decadal Survey proposed the so-called Venus in situ Explorer mission, the VICE mission, and this was viewed as a precursor to VSSR. It was proposed as a New Frontiers mission. Uh, it would lift samples into the Venus cloud layer for analysis lasting weeks instead of hours. That was the whole idea. And this is pretty much what we're talking about here. Now, it turned out that as conceived, this mission proved unaffordable in New Frontiers. And since the early 2000s, there's been very little work on this concept. And people who proposed for the VICE mission have not proposed missions that lift samples into the cloud layer, it just proved to be unaffordable. So what, what happened in the 19, late 1990s uh, here? Uh, what ideas were put together? Well, his uh, concept, I call it the baseline concept because it was the one that most people seemed to prefer. Uh, it was to send a, a vehicle to the surface uh, of Venus with a, uh, an ascent rocket uh, called a Venus Ascent Vehicle, VAV for short, packaged inside it and hopefully protected very carefully with uh, thermal and pressure protection from the environment. It would acquire a sample and it would rise rapidly to uh, back into the upper atmosphere where this could be launched from. Uh, no uh, touched on the fact that uh, uh, it's difficult enough to get things to the surface without them heating up again, but then you have the job of getting back up again. So it seemed to me, and I was involved peripherally in this, that this wasn't really a great idea, uh, that there might, be a, there might be an alternative way to do it. Uh, 
this this shows the uh, lifting of the uh, vehicle into orbit, and it shows the concept of then rendezvous of the sample that's injected into orbit with a with an orbiter. Now that part of it, there was a great deal of synergy with the uh, with the Mars sample return. So once you get into orbit, it sort of looks like Mars sample return. Now it's harder because Venus has a higher gravity. And so getting a rocket up into orbit in the first place and then out of orbit is much more difficult than on Mars, but conceptually it's similar. But my thought on this concept was to look at the idea of atmospheric rendezvous where the rocket wouldn't have to go to the surface. Uh, and you bring the sample return canister up alone, the ascent balloon could be smaller, but you did have the problem of rendezvous and, and how you connect it up with that. And so this, um, these uh, comparisons were illustrated in this chart, which shows the baseline, and then two types of uh, atmospheric rendezvous, a, a balloon a blimp rendezvous uh, and a balloon to airplane rendezvous. Uh, and I've compared them in terms of technology readiness. Uh, so if you look here at the, uh, uh, at the thermal and pressure protection line, well, technology readiness for getting a, a rocket able to be protected against that environment is very low. Correspondingly for the balloon and blimp, it's not required, so it's high. On the other hand, for atmospheric rendezvous, there's no problem of rendezvous for the baseline concept. Uh, for, the, uh, for the two alternatives here, I characterize it as moderate. I was maybe being a little bit optimistic, but you know, one is, and one certainly was in those days. We, we certainly were much more uh, confident about the possibilities of technology. And, and then, of course, there's the issue of atmospheric tr sample transfer. And, and I believe that the atmospheric transfer would be easier for the blimp than it would be for the airplane. So that was that concept. And I mentioned a few minutes ago this idea of the Venus in situ explorer. So I went back to this document, the uh, decadal report of that time. Now, they do these every decade. There's, there was one 10 years after this one, and there's one underway now. So this was 20 years ago. And so the idea of this mission was to obtain the core sample, loft to altitude for further geo, geochemical and mineralogical analysis. They noted that uh, one of the side benefits of this is you get lots of measurements, winds and radiometry to understand radiation balance. And then uh, you'd be able to learn about those greenhouse effect on this. And importantly here, their motivation was that this would be pave the way for a paradigm authoring sample return mission uh, in the following decade. This, uh, this concept was picked up by NASA and included as a vice new frontiers mission for the decade 2003 to 2012. And by the way, the scientific uh, requirements or the scientific uh, accomplishments that this mission could make uh, still remain part of the requirements for the Venus mission that's called for in New Frontiers, which is really rather bizarre. Now, uh, what about the, the, uh, the roadmap? Uh, Norm talked to you about these strategic documents, the so-called GOI, the roadmap, and the technology plan. We were very cautious. This was before uh, the selections of the uh, three missions. We hadn't had a Venus mission since 1983 was the Magellan mission selected, almost 40 years. And so we wanted to be very clear that important Venus science could be accomplished that with technology that we had today or that was near at hand. And so uh, we, we did not include in the roadmap a Venus sample return mission explicitly. The one a decade earlier did. Uh, and we also pointed out that realistically, we need to learn from the experience of the Mars program, where initially back in 1999, they were very naive about what was involved. And of course, it's ultimately taken a, uh, 
a dedicated funded program of multiple missions over, well, maybe not three decades, but certainly two uh, uh, before being able to propose a sample return mission. Uh, I mean, it, it did take this program involving curiosity, now it's Mars 2020, to get there. And now there are three missions actually involved in the process of acquiring a sample and bringing it to Earth. Three missions in the, in the sense of three separate launches. So we view the capabilities are well beyond the time frame of the roadmap. So with the selection of the three missions to Venus, after almost 40 years without a NASA mission, we now feel we can be a little more aggressive about the possibilities. So let's go on now to talk about lifting samples from the surface to the cloud layer. Um, back in, the, uh, in this period, I actually began in 1995 before the, um, before the work on the Venus sample return, we were already looking at JPL in materials for the subsurface, uh, for the uh, surface of Venus. We then looked at single balloon architectures, metallic balloons, and ultimately two stage balloon architectures for this task. So let's talk about first about the use of this so-called polybenzoxazole film. This was at that time, kind of a fairly recent invention of a polymer that would survive up to the temperatures of the Venus surface. Now we were already looking at a concept of a deep dive vehicle at Venus that would go down to the surface and image the surface and come back to where the region was co cooler to telemetre data back. This was called the Venus Geoscience Aerobot. And so we looked at this material for this very purpose. And a company uh, called Foster Miller worked on this. They were adapting the, uh, the, uh, the PBO material, now known as, now known as Xylon, um, uh, from a fiber to a film. And they had the technology for accomplishing this. And they made several of these balloons. They coated them with a gold coating because it became clear early on that uh, PBO didn't like sulfuric acid or sulfur dioxide. Unfortunately, uh, gold coating did not have the integrity to protect the polymer from so sulfuric acid. And this indicated that other approaches were needed for bringing the surface sample to the upper atmosphere. So we simply couldn't use a single balloon. At about the same time, uh, a little later, JPL had conceived the concept of a Venus Mobile Explorer. This was a floating vehicle uh, near the surface that functionally and scientifically would be rather like a Mars rover. Uh, but instead of having to wheel around on the surface of a very rough terrain, uh, since the atmosphere is so dense, you can, uh, you can create this metallic can, uh, inflate it with, with pressurized gas, and it can very, a very small vehicle of a few cubic meters can carry a significant payload. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it, although it was easy to float, the, uh, the, re the rest of the technology, the power, refrigeration, uh, was simply not there. And so that idea really has been deferred to some future decade. But we did pick the idea up as a, uh, a step in the, uh, in the process of bringing a sample from the surface of Venus to the cloud layer. And this uh, concept here of a two-stage balloon, stage one is a metal bellows balloon. Stage two is capped on, not quite as high temperature as, as uh, PBO, but uh, uh, can, ha can handle temperatures in excess of 400. And coated with Teflon, if we, de if we uh, deploy this higher in the atmosphere, then uh, we can get this to work. And so the metal balloon, Bellows balloon is partially inflated during descent. And after samples are required, inflation is completed and the metal balloon rises. Uh, when it's completely filled with gas, it exchanges gas to the Capton balloon. And this is illustrated here in a little bit more detail in the graphic on the right. Uh, the graphic on the left shows how this metal balloon Bellows uh, works. Uh, in, uh, in A, the, the actual atmospheric pressure is higher on the balloon, so it's fully compressed 
And, and then when you change that and you increase the pressure inside, it expands. So with uh, 114 uh, millibars, about a tenth of an atmosphere, it's expanded to about half its full size. And then with 630 millibars, it's fully inflated. And, and at that point, it's no longer reversible. Uh, the coating on that and the funny color uh, is a result of actually testing this in a Venus simulated environment, which has, uh, has uh, uh, caused some chemical modification to the exterior. So, uh, and that's something we always have to worry about with the uh, Venus missions, particularly those that last longer. So, so this was the concept. Uh, I would say that uh, at this point, it's got no obvious showstoppers, although clearly many engineering details need to be worked. Uh, and specifically the timeline for initial inflation of the metal balloons. And then packaging and separation of the metal balloons from the Kapton balloon. And the concept that uh, Viktor Kazanovich originally put together, uh, the uh, balloon was inflated below and then they had to flip after separation which looked a little complicated. Uh, options that might be further explored in this study would, would be, how would you integrate this with a conventional lander capable of precision landing? And then concepts for a grab sample lander where no landing is required. And, and uh, Noam touched briefly on that sort of concept. So that's kind of where we are with that, uh, that concept. Nothing further has been done on this to my knowledge. Uh, since about 2005. Uh, uh, but now we can uh, begin in this uh, KISS study to start rethinking how this uh, might be implemented. So let me now talk about, uh, about the aerial laboratory. And I'm going to start about uh, talking first about the Venus Aerial Platform Study. Uh, this was not formally a KISS study, but it was conducted in the KISS manner, and it was actually conducted in the KISS facility uh, by virtue of NASA sponsorship. And this took place with two, uh, uh, two uh, meetings back in 2018. And it was quite a seminal study in terms of setting the future for these cloud level aerobots. Uh, I'm gonna talk in more detail about this variable altitude aerobot and the kind of Venus science that can be done with it, touching on some of the things that Noah mentioned. And then I'm going to be talking about the technology options for the aerial laboratory. So back in 2018, uh, NASA sponsored a study, which was actually motivated in part by the interest in, in providing an aerial platform payload to, uh, uh, to be included in a, in a Venus mission planned by Russia called uh, Venera D. And, uh, and so NASA had some ideas on how to do that, but uh, they decided that we really need to, since this was seeming to be quite serious, we needed to be really clear on what could be accomplished. And so candidates uh, for, this, uh, for this mission then were a, a fixed altitude aerobot. This is a super pressure balloon, really an enlarged version of Vega but with much better super pressure technology. So we'd be confident that it could really uh, survive the temperatures of the Venus day. And then uh, above that is a so-called variable altitude aerobot, a vehicle that is not constrained as the super pressure vehicle is to one altitude, but can modify its altitude. And there were various ideas for this. One was so-called pump compression, where you would, uh, pump gas from a, what's basically a super pressure balloon like the one below into a, uh, into, a, into a balloon above that, which is not pressurized. And so uh, you're just basically keeping the same volume of gas, but changing the, uh, changing the overall volume of the balloon. As the volume goes up, the balloon rises. And then the concept of the immediate right of that, the mechanical compression balloon, which were a series of super pressure balloons uh, held together by a tether, and they could be, uh, and the overall volume of that could be changed by changing the length of the tether. Another concept in the mix here, the hybrid air, air, airship was uh, was uh, also a buoyant vehicle, uh, but it was inflated in space 
and entered in the atmosphere uh, using a, uh, a protective uh, coating to protect it from the heating and then assumed the role of this hybrid airship. It had the advantage that it could travel uh, uh, laterally uh, in, um, in, uh, in, in X and Y as well as vertically. Not illustrated here was the concept of a solar airplane. Uh, but the net result of this is depicted in the graphic uh, below uh, where we've plotted the science value on the vertical axis, the complexity on the horizontal axis, and the color denotes the, the technical maturity. Now, Noam touched on the, the fact that when you're putting a mission together, that there are a number of different factors you have to weigh. And these three are the principal ones. So the variable altitude balloon we considered to represent the sweet spot in the sense that its science value is quite high Technologically, it was moderate, uh, and uh, and in size and complexity, it was not going to be too challenging. We contrast this with the hybrid airship, where there were many technologies that had not been proven, and it was going to have to be a huge vehicle of 60 meters in size, uh, and with many, many parts that had to be assembled. And in science, it wasn't materially higher than the uh, than the variable altitude vehicle. There were two that were looked at here uh, that differed in terms of range. And that's illustrated further here as we went into this in more detail. Uh, this is the, uh, this is, uh, shows a, uh, a set of different uh, concepts for uh, variable altitude aerobots. Um, and, and we've also included the fixed one here and the range on the on on Venus that these can cover. Now, you may already be familiar with this uh, picture of the Venus clouds from what Noam has already shown. Uh, the type A, the fixed altitude is constrained to the middle of the clouds. The type B can maneuver over a considerable range within the clouds. The type C can get to the base of the clouds. And the attractive thing about that is from the cloud base you can image the surface in certain frequencies or in certain uh, optical wavelengths, infrared actually, um, and at certain times of day. You can only do this at night. You can't do it at daytime. Looking at the heat emitted from the surface, not uh, light reflected. So ultimately, we settle on the, uh, the Type B aerobot for future work uh, because of its large payload fraction for scientific instrument and a wide altitude range. This uh, shows a little bit more about the balloon and it shows the payload that it would carry with a set of instruments. It includes the batteries that would uh, supply energy. It does not include the solar panels because one of the features of this balloon, in contrast with Vega, is that it had solar power, so that enabled it to operate for more than a few days. <clears throat> this uh, illustrates how this balloon works. Um, uh, essentially, if you're floating at a high alt higher altitude, in this case, 62 kilometers is more or less the ceiling, to descend, you have to pump gas from the zero pressure balloon into the super pressure balloon. Zero pressure balloon sinks and you drop. And the lower altitude range is 52 kilometers. Temperature there is about 60 C. And in the heat of the day, it gets up to about 80. So you don't really want to go much below that with conventional systems. Uh, to rise, it's much easier. You, you just vent gas back into the balloon and up you go. Uh, and so uh, this is the concept we've been working with. And the concept right now, uh, Noam talked a little bit about the sort of science you'd like to do with, um, with this um, vehicle. Uh, and one of the things is very important is to study the aerosols, the composition of the clouds. Uh, no, no mention that uh, the Da Vinci, which is gonna descend through the clouds, it's, it's gonna focus on the clouds, uh, on, the, on, the, on the gas. It has no means as far as I know to uh, look at aerosols. It certainly is not equipped to look at the chemistry of the aerosols. 
So uh, we've been working with uh, Professor Rick Flagan. This is JPL effort uh, led by uh, Dragan Nikolic there to develop a, uh, a very powerful instrument weighing around 10 kilograms that could study the chemistry of these aerosol particles. Another part of this mission is to study the atmospheric dynamics and radiation balance. This vehicle is being swept around with the winds. It can modulate its uh, altitude and explore the winds in different uh, regimes. It can also look at the upward and downward welling radiation. And then finally, uh, and Noam touched on this, uh, we are uh, going to be doing geophysics, taking advantage of the uh, fact we have an intimate relation with the atmosphere, which we don't have in orbit, and we have proximity that we don't have in orbit. Uh, we're only 50 kilometers from the surface. So we're going to detect both seismic waves from their acoustic signature, and uh, we're going to search for remnant magnetism, which could be evidence of an early core, and who knows, remnant magnetism, has, uh, of course, has been the key to unraveling the histories of uh, continental drift on the Earth, plate tectonics. And so, you know, maybe we have that on Venus, too. We, we don't have plate tectonics as we know it, but there's some indication of subduction and, and, and so forth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this infrasound area. Uh, Noam set it up. I, uh, I'll take advantage of it here. Uh, but it also illustrates what you can accomplish with the KISS study. The KISS workshop in 2014 was focused on the idea of looking at different ways of uh, studying seismology on Venus from orbit, from the surface. The surface is, is conventional, uh, using uh, doing the same way as, as, as it's being done, done on Earth today and on the Mars InSight mission at Mars, but it's very hot there. And uh, as you've heard already, uh, having a vehicle uh, operate there for more than a few hours is very difficult. So uh, we took advantage of the uh, fact that actually emerged from an earlier KISS study that um, on, on Venus, because of the dense atmosphere, 60% more seismic energy is communicated into the atmosphere than on Earth. And so the possibility exists that we can see that signal either from a balloon or from orbit with a, uh, an orbit looking at various kinds of electromagnetic signatures that might be generated when that acoustic wave hits the upper atmosphere. So all three ideas were uh, considered in this report, but I'm just going to talk about one of them here. And uh, actually what happened here, this, this uh, led to a, a, a study that uh, Jennifer Jackson Campus and I were involved in, jointly sponsored by KISS and the JPL uh, Strategic uh, Initiatives Program. And uh, we conducted measurements of uh, using an artificial seismic source and showed we could detect uh, seismic waves produced in this fashion seismic waves produced by an explosion, but we had never done it for an actual quake. And then uh, two years ago, uh, there was a major quake in Ridgecrest. And we put together a very hurriedly an expedition to go out to the Mojave Desert. And in two weeks to fly balloons over Ridgecrest, looking for aftershocks. There were four launches here, and uh, they went in wildly different directions because stratospheric altitudes, the winds are very divergent. But lo and behold, uh, we made the first detection of an earthquake from its acoustic signal. And the results of this were just published uh, just, a, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So you can, uh, you can find that uh, in, the, uh, in the references I've included in this uh, uh, in this report. Um, and of course, uh, in going back to Venus, uh, we're very excited that we may be seeing uh, quakes there, not just from faults, of which there are many, but from volcanoes, of which there are many more. And uh, at the campus, uh, Jack Wilding and others, including Jennifer Jackson, now Leo Martyr, have been looking at uh, 
quakes generated from volcanic calderas. And they're just uh, hyperactive seismically. I mean, uh, this one was producing multiple uh, magnitude five quakes. So if the volcanoes on Venus are doing that, we're gonna see them. Uh, so let me now uh, touch on what the technology options for the aerial laboratory are. So one of these might be a variable altitude balloon. A second, it would be a blimp. Uh, now we talked about how the blimp was too complex for the, uh, for the uh, uh, study we talked about. Well, now we have more time. We may be a little bit more ambitious. This one here does not attempt to fly into the atmosphere. This is inflated after entry. And then uh, the other concept is a solar airplane. So this is not a buoyant vehicle at all. And it takes a fact, uh, advantage of the fact that very high in the Venus atmosphere, there's a lot of sunlight. In fact, twice as much as on the Earth if you're on the right side of the planet. And so uh, it's possible to fly an airplane. Which of these is the best option? Well, I'm actually leaning towards the solar airplane. Uh, now, I think the others can be made to work, but some of the disadvantages it had in the previous uh, application uh, are advantages here. Disadvantages, it couldn't really do anything but station keep on the sunny side of the planet. We wanted to go on the back side of the planet, on the dark side of the planet. It can also, it's the only one that can actually station keep over a sampling site. So we see here the possibility of station keeping and long duration. But again, this is something that should be looked at more thoroughly as part of the study. So uh, just a second, I'm just checking my time here. Okay, I have about four minutes, I think. So I'm gonna go now into the last part of the presentation which deals with selecting the site to sample. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on why surviving on the surface is so difficult and uh, so limited in time. I'm gonna talk about how we might navigate to the sampling site and how we might transfer the sample to the aerial lab. So selecting the site to sample. So I, I mentioned earlier that the aerial platform, the type C, uh, which can descend uh, to the base of the plows can image the night glow from the hot surface at about 10 meter resolution. There are a couple of ways we could do this. Um, one is to use the uh, aerial platform the, to descend to that, to that level. Now, the problem is it's over 100 C, maybe 110. Uh, the balloon itself uh, uh, would be hotter still because We've got electronics inside it. So, but there's this concept we think we'll be able to do it. But another concept has emerged recently is the idea of a tow body, which is deploying a, a vehicle on a tow line. This is a 10 meter tow line, a 10 kilometer tow line below a mid cloud aerobot. And, and this would then have take images and after Acquiring those images, it would be hoisted back to the parent vehicle and the images downloaded. And this could be done repeatedly. And uh, I don't have any illustrations of what could be done, but it would be quite powerful. Uh, now that limits you to about 10 meter resolution. Now, what if you wanted to do better than that? Well, you really do have to get closer to the surface. Now it turns out DaVinci, DaVinci Plus, I think it's called, is, is, is gonna be doing that. Uh, it's, it's going to be sending a probe to the surface. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, they haven't disclosed the, the capabilities of the imaging system, but it could well be that they can get better than one meter imaging. Uh, but what we looked at about five or six years ago was the concept of a guided probe. Uh, and this, uh, or guided aerosond, this is something that would descend rapidly to the surface and then level off and fly level, acquiring images much in the fashion that uh, an aerial, uh, aerial photography is acquired. And this would have the advantage that you could target to things you really wanted to see. And then you could get a strip of stereo imaging along the travis, which would be much more valuable. And you could do this at sub meter resolution. Uh, 
Jim Garvin, who's the uh, PI for the Da Vinci Plus, uh, wrote a paper on the uh, value of uh, submeter imaging uh, uh, about three years ago, and uh, and also included some simulations. Now, these pictures here are, are images that would be at roughly 30 centimeters per pixel. Uh, and he figured they could do that from an altitude of 150 meters just before the probe hit. Um, the, the issue is, of course, if the probe is coming down, and this is 150 meters before it hits, it doesn't have a lot of time to communicate data uh, to the platform that deploys it. So there are some issues there if we can really exploit this to the full. I want to talk about this issue of survival time on the surface. Uh, the, all of the Russian landers uh, and all of the ones that we in the US have planned ever since have used the same approach for extending lifetime on the surface. We, we use the same approach that we use to preserve our, our, our lunch if we decide to go to the beach. We, we, we put ice in it basically. Now it's a fancy kind of ice that melts at a slightly higher temperature, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, experience as indicated uh, would maybe provide two to five hours on the surface. I think the longest Soviet mission was a little less than three hours. Uh, with careful design, we can do better than that, but, but we're not going to get much beyond that. The next step is to use what we call expendable cooling. Essentially, uh, what you exploit here is the higher uh, latent heat of the liquid to vapor transition compared to solid to liquid. It's about a factor of seven higher. And so in this case, the concept is to use ammonia inside the vehicle and you vent it to the outside. Um, now you have to do some fancy things with this. You have to pressurize it because otherwise uh, uh, at these pressures, uh, the, uh, the, the, the boiling temperature of ammonia is far too high to be useful. It's around 140 C. But if you pressurize it with helium, uh, it works much better. To go beyond that, uh, you need active cooling. Uh, energy on the surface of Venus is a major challenge. Um, and to cool this vehicle, even a small part of the vehicle needs many, many uh, nuclear, uh, I mean, uh, radioisotopic uh, uh, heating elements to accomplish this to the point that it's uh, it doesn't look to be really practical for a mission at this point. JPL a couple of years ago looked at the idea of using wind power on the surface and uh, taking advantage as, as, as Noam suggested of using electronics that can operate at somewhat higher temperatures. This means that you don't have to cool things quite as much as you would if you want to use you know, standard electronics. Still, it turns out to be pretty tough and there's not much wind, wind power. In fact, you can't just put the windmill on the surface. You have to float the rotor up to something like one kilometer in the atmosphere to get wind. So, you know, realistically, time available on the surface for sample sec selection and acquisition will, will be less than 10 hours. It may, it may be if you do some hero heroic work in reducing the dissipation uh, new insulation approaches, but it's, 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 it's not going to be much longer than that. Consequently, the lander must be targeted directly to the sampling site. There's no time to rove from the sampling site, uh, from the landing site to the sampling site. So what this really means is that we need to have a lander that can be able to uh, not only avoid hazards in the area where it lands, but target sampling sites designated by prior missions. What I've shown on the upper right are the possible landing sites that were designated for the Mars 2020 mission. Um, and of course they pick one of those and they were able to successfully land there. We, we're gonna want one or two for uh, the science in, in all likelihood. And so uh, to assure accuracy of sampling, uh, we're going to want an accuracy of landing of maybe as much as a meter. 
And so we're going to need the hazard avoidance and pinpoint landing systems to do this during descent. And we can benefit from those that developed for Mars 2020 and indeed the Europa missions. But we have to adapt them to the conditions on Venus where uh, the optical problem of imaging the surface is more challenging. And then we need the control system to guide to the surface. And, and the picture on the, light, uh, on the right shows such a concept that we did at JPL a couple of years ago, uh, where we have rotors that you operate as you de descend to the surface to steer, in this case, to a safe side. What about transferring sample to the aerial lab now? OK, the sample is up there. And we talked earlier about the possible versions of the aerial lab. Uh, and in some of these, you might have a very long way to go to get to it. In others, uh, if, in, in the case of the solar airplane, it might be a shorter distance. But uh, in either case, you have, uh, uh, you have challenges uh, in, in doing this. Uh, the Creare company has come up with a very interesting uh, concept for doing this, which is a, uh, a kind of rotorcraft which uh, uh, can fly horizontally in a very efficient way. And so it seemed to me it might be a, uh, an interesting idea for pursuing for this application. So just in summary for this uh, set of ideas on sample site selection and transfer, uh, we're going to need aerial vehicles capable of imaging from below the clouds and descending to target the, the surface. Lifetime is limited, and so the descent vehicle must go to the sampling site directly. And the sampling vehicle must locate the site to be sampled during descent and navigate to it using an aerodynamic control system. We don't use propulsion on Venus here, very dense atmosphere, so this is all aerodynamic. And then the samples must be drilled, transferred to the ascent balloon, and lofted into the cloud layer. And then some kind of sample retrieval drone is going to be needed to uh, retrieve the sample. Now, I see I've run out of time. I'm going to skip over these, and I'm going to go directly to the summary chart. So uh, summary, we have formidable challenges uh, for Venus in situ sample retrieval and analysis. But I think these recent uh, and ongoing developments mean that we can now begin to chart out a strategy for getting there. Uh, the strategy adopted for Mars sample return in 2008, I didn't talk about that, but there was a new strategy there of dividing the mission into several component missions should also be followed here. And because of that, we need a long-lived area laboratory, something that can be there for years uh, and that needs to be part of the strategy. We're going to need high resolution imaging uh, uh, and precision targeting to samples to be uh, sure that we acquire high value samples. We can't just go anywhere. We have to go somewhere where those high value samples are present. And then the three Venus missions that were just approved will each provide important data for planning the strategy but we also need to carry out the next phases of aerial and surface exploration with the aerobots, with the landed missions before we can move to the more ambitious missions. So thank you.